Um, okay, so before we continue with our program, I want to take a moment to provide some background on our project, um, which is called Building Institutional Markets for High Protein Specialty Crops. And that is the initiative that, that, that basically led to the organizing of this webinar. So this has been a three-year long project that is now coming to an end uh, within the next month. And it has had as a purpose creating new markets with institutional food buyers in the healthcare sector um, for high protein specialty crop producers, specifically of legumes. So California is one of the regions, um, one of the four regional pilots of this project. And the focus of this region has been on dry beans, which is what we will be discussing today. Um, on one end, uh, beans provide an excellent opportunity to meet dietary protein needs, and uh, while also providing human and environmental health benefits. And on the other end, simultaneously engaging institutional buyers to purchase from regional producers um, helps to strengthen regional food systems, and it also stimulates the economies of local um, so we have seen the opportunity to, in, to support regional economies, community health and nutrition, and environmental sustainability all via one initiative. Um, all right, so one, some of our specific objectives have focused on increasing access to and awareness of access to beans and awareness of their benefits within hospitals for patients, staff, and visitors and on for facilitating the purchasing between hospitals and regional producers. Um, but one of our goals has been to provide training, technical assistance, and marketing support to dry bean producers, um, because that is essential to be able to achieve our goals um, and to support the creation of these new markets and supporting regional food systems and environmental sustainability as a whole. So this is the objective that has Brought us, up, brought us together today. So before we continue, I'd like to introduce our California project team um, who have focused on providing technical assistance throughout the length of the project. We have Winnell um, Engelskirchen, Angles um, who is the Sustainable Food and Farming Coordinator with UC Serip, um, and her work has focused on market channel development for niche agricultural crops with dual economic and environmental potential, as well as in farm to institution purchasing pathways and small farm viability. Um, thank you, Winnell, for being here, for organizing this. Um, we also have Josefina Lara Chavez, who is the Senior Manager of Connect Farmer Programming and Farm to Market at Community Alliance with Family Farmers. So the webinar uh, today will cover both direct sales and wholesale market channels for dry beans. We know that this is not, that not everyone on this webinar will be in a position to sell to institutions or may not be interested in doing that. And that's totally fine. Um, but since this is the core aspect of the project and of the work of Healthcare Without Harm, we wanted to get a sense of the audience's interest. So you will see a poll coming up shortly. And yes, the question is, are you interested in or currently selling to institutions, whether it's hospitals, schools, or any other institution? Um, and the responses are, I'm currently selling to institutions. I'm interested and have the capacity to start. I'm interested but do not have the capacity to start, whether it's due to infrastructure, um, buyer relationships, volume, land, et cetera, are you not interested um, in selling to institutions or is it not applicable? Are you not a farmer? So we'll give you like a minute or so to answer that question. Wonderful, okay. So we have a majority that has an interest but not has is struggling with the capacity, um, which is an issue that We've seen, so thank you for sharing. Um, some folks who have the capacity to start it, some who are not interested or not applicable, no one who's currently selling into institutions. So um, 
Awesome. We hope the panel discussion today supports um, your your interests and your needs. So thank you for sharing that. And now I will hand it off to Gwynnell to begin our panel discussion. Great. Um, thanks, Maxi, and thanks to everyone for being here and to our speakers for joining and sharing their knowledge and experience um, along the bean supply chain. Um, as, as Maxi said, this kind of, you know, there's a way in which we're going to cover a lot of ground today. Um, these um, speakers occupy different places um, in terms of their their role and their engagement with growing and selling beans. Um, but for that reason, I'm excited to have this conversation and to bring them together. So I'm gonna briefly introduce them and then Maxie and I are gonna alternate um, asking questions of the panelists. Um, we are gonna do some screen sharing and um, photo sharing to illustrate um, some, some production and some different approaches to sales and marketing. Um, so just appreciate your patience with any kind of transitions around um, screen sharing and slides and that sort of thing. Um, and then at the end, Josefina is going to uh, facilitate a Q and A. Um, so there'll be time for, for folks who have joined us to ask some questions directly of the speakers. Um, if things come up as they're presenting that you wanna ask, feel free to put that into the Q&A. Um, we'll either get to that at the end of the webinar um, or you know, folks can possibly respond throughout. Um, so just to introduce our speakers um, briefly, and then I'll also you know, let them introduce themselves, but Michael Bosworth is the founder and CEO of Next Generation Foods, which is a food distribution company in West Sacramento. It was founded in 2006 with a focus on transforming how agricultural products move through the supply chain. And Michael himself is a farmer. He operates Ruin Forsman Ranch, which produces over a dozen varieties of rice um, and is particularly renowned for basmati. Um, Teresa Kurtak is one of the owners and operators of Fifth Crow Farm, which is a 150 acre organic farm in Pescadero. And the farm sells produce, fruit, flowers, eggs, and dry beans to customers at Bay Area farmers markets through a weekly CSA. Um, to farmers markets, as I said, and to restaurant and wholesale accounts. Um, and Teresa is bringing over 15 years of experience growing uh, and marketing dry beans. Um, and the farm currently grows about 10 acres of dry beans um, with a specialization in, in rare and heirloom varieties. So I think with that, um, we'll kick it off to to the, the questions and open the floor to our panelists. And so um, we wanted to start with you, Teresa, and just to hear um, kind of a, a background on the farm and how beans fit in um, to your farming model. Um, <clears throat> so hi, I'm Teresa. And I can't believe when you said 15 years, it's like I write it all the time. I've been writing it on things. And it kind of is always a shock that I've been, <laughs> that this farm is that old. Um, we've been doing this that long, but we have. And um, we are a very diversified operation. We started out as a farmer's market farm, um, then added a CSA. We always did a little bit of restaurant sales. Um, CSA came in a few years in. Um, for those of you that don't know what a CSA is, it's a subscription model. So um, people pay ahead for boxes during the season. Um, and I'm going to kind of take you, I was thinking I, to try to make this less boring rather than me just talking, I wanted to at least share some photos. Um, and honestly, the easiest way to do that is maybe to take you on a tour kind of through our website. So we grow sort of, I'm, I can't take you on a tour of the farm, so I'm touring you through it <laughs> through it via the website. Um, we grow specialty greens. Uh, we have a cut flower operation that keeps three to five people full time employed doing that. Um, we do dry beans. Um, 
and we market. So, and we also have, oh, you know what I, uh, let's see. We also have orchards. We do kind of unusual varieties of heirloom apples. Um, and we have a pastured egg operation. We're kind of a one-stop shop. Um, we're a, a truly very diversified operation. Um, and we market uh, in the same way as we've diversified what we're growing. We also have a diversified approach to marketing. Uh, it's mostly direct sales, but we do um, probably now maybe 50 to 60% of our business is farmer's markets. Um, and then we have our uh, our CSA shares. Um, and then we also sell to restaurants and have, have wholesale accounts. Um, and have I kind of covered, let's see what else about us. Um, that's kind of the, the sort of the nitty gritty of it. Um, so. And can you say a little bit about um, how you started with dry beans? Did, were they always a part of your diversified farming operation? Did you add them later and sort of what prompted you to, to include them? Yeah, so um, let's see here, maybe I can take you back. Uh, so we, uh, the beans have been a part of our operation since the beginning. It was part of a marketing strategy um, for us. Uh, coming in as new growers, it was very hard to get into um, these uh, super popular farmers markets. Um, so we kind of sold ourselves um, with the eggs and the beans. And we had done our, our uh, let's see here, I have some pictures of some of the beans, but we, we've started with the beans right from the get-go. Um, and but honestly, we we didn't expect to be making that much money from it. <laughs> it was more of a marketing strategy and it allowed us, it created, uh, it was something that there weren't that many people doing in the markets. And so it allowed us to get into farmer's markets initially. We've done it since the beginning. We also love the idea of being able to supply our customers, not just with um, with vegetables and produce, but being able to supply them a full diet, it was sort of a goal. So even though we didn't do CSA at the beginning, it was this idea that, you know, maybe we're not going to get into meat production. We do uh, cull our hens and sell um, stew birds, but um, we wanted our CSA to be able to provide a pretty complete diet if we could. We actually dabbled in grains, but we're in a really bad climate for grain growing. Um, and um Let's see what else I had some notes here that I didn't want to miss. Um, so we're currently growing probably six to between six and 10 acres. It varies year to year. Uh, we grow over 12 varieties. Um, I know some people had asked about types of varieties. I'll talk about that more, but we, we don't grow lentils. We don't grow garbanzos. We don't grow um, lima beans. All of those need a much longer growing season and a hotter climate. Um, but we do grow a lot of very unusual, um, threat kind of endangered varieties. Um, and, um, we market them almost completely direct to consumer. So there are restaurants like high-end restaurants that are buying, you know, larger volumes. Uh, but in general, almost everything is being sold direct to the end user. Um, so... Yeah, that's, that's great sort of overview and background. And so now moving from kind of the, the direct market end of the supply chain over to you, Michael. Um, and I guess just to orient the conversation, if you could start by giving us background around next generation foods, um, what you do, how you started, and then how dry beans fit into your business model and, and the work that you're doing. Sure. Yeah, so um, I'm a farmer uh, in Yuba and Sutter County. We grow a lot of different varieties of rice, um, many of which we started growing uh, after I started Next Generation Foods because we had access to demand for specialty rice. So uh, I started uh, my company in 2006, um, direct marketing into food service, our rice. We started with one variety of rice and organic cow rows. 
started selling into fine dining and, uh, you know, quickly found institutional food service uh, at UC Davis and started supplying, uh, you know, all the students that were living in the dorms and the larger uh, cafe on campus, the co-op or the uh, coffee house. And, you know, that was just the, that was an eye-opening experience going from, you know, delivering 25 pounds of rice to a restaurant versus 2000 pounds a week, you know, going into institutional food service. So um, I guess as things go, uh, you know, our, our chefs started asking for more and more products. Hey, can you get me almonds? Can you get me walnuts? You know, can you get me olive oil? And it just made sense to broaden our, uh, product mix and, uh, help other farms distribute efficiently and also help chefs, uh, buy from a lot of different farms without having to deal with. 20 invoices and delivery dates and all that kind of stuff. So that's what we started in 2006. Um, we currently have a warehouse in West Sacramento and we're delivering uh, five days a week. We spend a lot of time in the Bay Area, also in the Sacramento area. Um, we serve a lot of tech accounts in the Bay Area, and universities throughout the Bay Area and uh, the Sacramento area. Uh, we distribute all the popcorn to Golden One Center. If you've been there, uh, that's organic popcorn grown in Pleasant Grove, which is about 15 miles up the road. Um, and yeah, just over time, it's we just respond to customer demand and find products for people. We we like to solve problems and make things easy for our chefs. So uh, we started selling dry beans probably about 2017 and currently we're selling organic black turtle beans organic red kidney beans organic mung beans organic garbanzos pintos mayakobas azukis cannellinis and navy beans that's our current mix um we also have a retail brand called true origin foods and we have two uh, dry bean skews currently. So we have an organic garbanzo and uh, organic black turtle bean. So that's that's kind of the, the gist of our trajectory and, um, you know, bean, bean program. Awesome, thank you. That's, um, yeah, great, great overview and, and background. Um, so coming, shifting back to you, Teresa, and now sort of um, shifting to thinking about production or talking about, you know, the actual growing of the beans. Um, can you walk us through what that looks like on your farm, the planting, the cultivation, the harvesting, the cleaning, all the different steps of the process? Yeah, so we're going to just rush through really, really fast. <laughs> um, we started out, I think the first year, maybe we planted, I don't know, like two acres, just really small amounts initially. And then we've slowly done a little more. We've gone all the way to um, 10 acres plus, and then we've shifted ourselves back, um, back and forth a bit. Uh, there's, well, let me, um, I'll pull up my my pictures here and share my screen again. Um, so let me try to show you um, just a few pictures of kind of our, our current production model. Uh, let's see here. I hope I can't see my tabs. Is it the screen? Nope, nope, there we go. Um, slideshow. So here's just some examples of some of the varieties of beans we grow. And this is Mitla Black, which is a tepary bean. This one's called Rio Zape. This one was a, this is a, a UC Davis experimental variety that we ended up not keeping. This is, these are called pebble beans. They have a really great story. Um, these are called bumblebee um, and King City Pink. And what else is here? I don't know, a bunch of them. Uh, we kind of 
our desire to grow a lot of varieties has left the um, growing process a lot more complex. So um, part of what we knew we couldn't do was grow a huge amount. At the time, we had a lot less acreage. Now we have about 150 acres. But when we started out, we only had about nine acres to work with. So um, we we really wanted to be able to direct market. We knew that people weren't going to buy uh, like kidney beans that they're very familiar with for a really high dollar value. We knew that there'd be a lot of hand labor. Um, so we that's why we have this crazy mix of unusual varieties. Um, I'm, I'm kind of a seed lover, seed saver. Um, so that was part of why we did this. The other thing I didn't mention earlier when you were asking why we got into beans to begin with um, that I think growers might be interested in is part of it was we grow a huge amount of brassicas and we were really having trouble as our organic farmers figuring out how to rotate the brassicas out. We grow broccoli, cauliflower, kale, cabbage, kohlrabi, and all of those are in the same plant family, and we really can't grow on the same acreage with the same thing. So beans was part of a strategy. Part of the amount of acreage that we're growing in beans actually has to do with being able to rotate our crops better. So that's just an FYI. Um, but we, uh, so we generally grow, I don't have, unfortunately, I don't have a lot of pictures of soil prep, um, but we, we grow on 60 inch beds and then we list those 60, we have a, a bed shaper that splits those 60 inch beds into two thirties and we use very old equipment for the beans. Um, we have some really old John Deere cedars. Um, one thing that we've learned is, is because we're growing such a diversity of varieties, uh, each seed you know, you know, you have to have a different seed plate and the the variation in size and shape, a lot of the more unusual, like the larger seeded varieties, there are no bean, there are no seed plates that work. And so we've had to custom make our own plates. Um, and in a lot of cases with the really large beans, someone actually sits on the back of the tractor and drops the seeds um, through the seeder. Uh, we've tried many, many times, experimented with different ways of seeding and, um, the that was our our neighbor who since passed away who used to grow a thousand plus acres of beans that was his that was that was his innovation his wife sat on the back of the tractor <laughs> and dropped the beans in even when he was like a thousand acres um and then uh most you know one of the advantages of beans is that you can grow beans with very little labor like that you can do almost everything with the tractor so um really one person with the right equipment can get a lot of acreage in and cultivate it and irrigate it and maintain it. And then the labor comes in the harvest um, cleaning and the harvest and the final cleaning. So it kind of creates this, uh, we have like a big push in the spring to get them in the ground. And then, but that's really only the tractor team that that is really stressed about that. And then the, the the big labor piece is all of a sudden starting in August mid August or so. Um, then we're we need we need people to pull them. Um, so <clears throat> we sow, we overhead water, and then we cultivate usually about three times. Uh, we generally don't lay any drip. Uh, we rely on just a, a handful of irrigations and on a with our soil. Um, we 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 can dry farm them. We've managed. I think twice we've managed to grow entire crops with only one irrigation. Um, the initial, you know, watering them in most of most years we have to irrigate a few times. Um, but especially like the tepary beans, which are from the Sonoran desert, um, they'll, they're, they grow in a desert. They're, they, they can produce a crop with very little water, um, which in the years that we've been drought prone, that's also, affected how much we plant when we thought, okay, well, we could get the beans in in the spring, we'll be able to irrigate them. And it doesn't matter if we don't have any water come August because they don't need it at that point. Um, and we can cut the irrigation off, just do one less irrigation, we'll generally still get a crop. Um, let's see, so uh, what you're looking at in that photograph uh, is the field, this is the bean field. I don't know if you can see my cursor and it's just starting to dry down. Part of why we don't grow all the same variety is because if you grow all the same variety, then you have to pull them and windrow them all at the same time. And we can't, we're not um, interested in hiring uh, like labor contractors. So if we want our crew to be able to do it, to do it, we have to spread the labor out. We can't have 
we can't need to pull the entire field all at once and not be able to harvest vegetables. So um, we have a bunch of different varieties and part of why we do is because they come on at different times and it allows us to spread out the harvest. Um, so oh, this is a picture um, early on, we tried all the various plans that we could find. This is a winter ore that we built from plans that are maybe from you. I think it was like Oregon State University maybe came up with this design. It's like a, a squirrel fan and you build a little shoot. Not worth the time. Just an FYI. <laughs> uh, here's uh, green. These are uh, beans um, after having been. So they've been sown, irrigated a couple times cultivated with the tractor. Uh, and then usually we'll send a crew of people in to just pull the last few remaining leaves, weeds. And that'll be like a one-time thing um, that will go through the whole field and pull anything that the, the tractor didn't get once the beans are too tall to keep cultivating. Um, this is, <clears throat> so generally beans, you know, you there's no harvester that harvests beans once they're dry. It's not like a um, a combine situation where you drive the combine over, you know, over like a wheat, you know, like wheat or something where you can actually combine it uh, in place because beans uh, shatter by the time that they're dry enough to put through the combine, you have to windrow them. You pull them up once they get to about 70 to 75% yellow. Uh, in our climate, we're so humid that we found that it was better for us to wait even longer. So this was, uh, this is my daughter. Um, kids love beans. Oh my God. If you have kids grow beans, they just have so much fun um, looking, you know, opening pods and checking things out. So this is walking the field, trying to decide which varieties are ready to harvest. Um, you can see the variation here. These are still green. These are yellow. They're about ready to pull. Uh, they get uh, after, so we, we tried all sorts of stuff, just wind roaring them, you know, the bigger growers will tend to pull them up and just pile them in rows on the soil. Uh, our production is on a small enough scale that we don't want to lose harvest to be, to it being shattered on the ground. Uh, we tried tarps, tarps accumulate moisture. We live in a very humid uh, climate, lots of fog. So, uh, one of the things that was actually a huge innovation that took us about five years to figure out. For some reason, I don't know why it took us so long to figure this out, but we use uh, landscaping fabric, just huge pieces of landscaping fabric, and we'll windrow sections of the field at a time onto the landscaping fabric. So here's a, a because the landscaping fabric is porous, so the dew goes right through. As long as they're still in the pods, even if they get lightly rained on, they'll be okay. Um, but if puddles or pools of water accumulate on a tarp, they um, you get, end up with rot and sorting out even a handful of rotting uh, rotting beans uh, really affects the quality and the time it takes to do the final cleaning. Um, so this is just a picture of the beans windrowed on these tarps. Uh, we, we um, on a smaller scale, uh, up until this year, we've done almost all the cleaning by hand. So we pile them like that. Then the thing that we found to be the most effective, we tried all sorts of small scale equipment, thresh, smaller scale threshers. And what we discovered was actually the most efficient thing. Again, this old, this neighbor of ours who did like a thousand acres, uh, Tom Phipps taught us this. Uh, we drive over it with an ATV. One person drives back and forth across the pile with an ATV while someone with a pitchfork kind of, loot, you know, shakes the, the um, lifts the beans and shakes the shattered beans to the bottom of the pile, right? And usually 70% of the beans come out in the first uh, the first threshing, the first pass. Then we switch the material over to an adjacent tarp, drive over it again, then you get 30%. About 30% comes out in the second pass. And then if you really don't want to lose anything, you do a final third pass and that's the last remaining 10% or so. Um, and then from there, we tried all sorts of small winnowers, um, but what we found to be the most effective are skilled people and a windy day. And the quality and clean, the clean, like we tried doing, not doing that step, bringing it in um, and then cleaning it in, in our um, warehouse, in our sheds and um, the winnowers, yeah, not if you're if you're operating on a smaller scale, um, I really think 
you just got to learn how to wait for that windy day and you take the pile and you dump with buckets into um, uh, you know, another a trash can or another big receptacle and you let the wind do its work. And we just happen to have a really amazing core group of employees who grew up in Mexico and who spent their childhoods on farms that all grew a, some small amount of their own beans. And so they already they they were good at it and we learned how to do it too and we uh, we tried all sorts of equipment and honestly people with a little bit of skill and wind and wind do it way faster than a lot of these really small scale threshers and these designs that have been come up by UC extension programs um so that's what we that's what we did for a long time now um we finally we tried uh like these old 1920s we had an all crop harvester and what we found was that uh, the time and volume of material it takes to get the adjustments right on the all crop harvester, this like 1920s era harvester. Um, they, they used to make, back in the day, make harvesters and, and threshers that, that were meant to, to uh, that were meant to thresh all sorts of different things from grains to beans, and they were adjustable and they were small. And those aren't really available. They're not produced anymore, these smaller scale uh, pieces of equipment. Um, so you're investing in this giant piece of equipment, that, which is like hundreds of thousands of dollars, which doesn't pencil out if you're only growing 10 acres of beans, right? Um, but this uh, is a thresher that's made in Turkey, made in Turkey right there. Uh, and our neighbor, uh, Ryan uh, from Blue House Farm also got, got into, got the bean bug and started growing beans um, a few years ago as well. And he researched and found through some other grower this uh, piece of equipment, contacted the company in Turkey. Um, there's a lot more smaller smaller scale growers there. So these pieces of equipment are available in other parts. In the third world, they're available. And he, here they're not. Um, and so he imported two of them, sold us one as a way to pay for the other one um, or to help pay for the shipping for the for both of for the other one. Um, and this definitely uh, sped up the threshing process significantly. There's a lot more shattering and there's a lot, it's it's very noisy. It becomes, instead of being this kind of quiet thing, it's something that I really worry about our employees and their hearing long-term because um, they keep wanting to take the ear, you know, the, um, ear protection off. It's very noisy, but two people were able to do um, what normally would have taken, you know, six people a couple weeks. Uh, two people did the whole thing this year by themselves. Um, so these are some more pictures of it working. Teresa, uh, this is your one minute warning. Thanks. So uh, the downside is it doesn't do as good of a job as people with a little wind. There's a lot more uh, little clods and, uh, you know, it gets the chaff out, but not the rocks and the dirt. So the hand cleaning at the end, um, I know Ryan is invested in a, a, a gravity separator of some sort, but, um, and we haven't, we haven't taken advantage of testing out our threshed crops to see how it went for him. But um, another couple of things here, uh, storage, uh, we use these big macro bins um, that is problematic if you don't have a front end loader or a tractor to easily move them around and they let light in, which causes the beans to discolor. Um, so we've tried, you can kind of see the discoloration in this photograph, like right here where they're lighter, they're darker on top, um, beans just, they turn darker with light exposure. Um, we've tried tarping them, uh, not greatly effective, um, but see, is there anything else I missed? I think that's about it. Um, yeah, storage is very tricky. Rain, when the rains hit, if they get wet, uh, you once they've been threshed, uh, your crop is very in a very precarious state and you could lose everything if you get if it gets wet. Um, so getting them out of the field can be really tricky depending on your climate. Um, another problem that we discovered is that um, we our beans don't dry out very fast, which means that they rehydrate, they don't, uh, they rehydrate better and they don't shatter as easily. But when we have really hot, dry weather, then the threshing becomes a lot trickier and using the, the um, standing thresher there is more challenging. There's a lot more shattering and we actually had to run things through a lot greener to keep it from shattering. Um, 
and I'm sure there'll be questions later, but um, yeah. There's, there's one question actually that um, might be good to take now, you know, while you have the photos up. And um, I think we still have a few minutes with your segment. Mm -hmm. sure. um, and this is the question in the chat and it was just clarifying how many people, um, you know, when you say the, the skill of your employees um, plus the wind is sort of your, your best um, way of cleaning, um, how many people is that? And then also um, you had talked about not harvesting all 10 acres at once. And so when you're doing that harvesting and cleaning, what is the sort of segment? Are you doing it in one acre blocks or, um, yeah, if you could speak to that a little bit more. Yeah, so um, it's not the whole crew. That, like sometimes if there's rain coming, then we'll send our entire crew of 30 people over to do something, you know, to, to work on beans. But in general, before the standing thresher, uh, we, we would parcel out the work um, certain days of the week. And the other thing is once beans get, if they get too dry, as you pull them, they'll shatter. So if you're in a hotter climate, you're going to need to pull them greener and let them let them dry on the tar. Otherwise, they'll shatter and you'll lose your crop on the ground. Um, so you can't really work with them if it's really hot and dry out. So we we generally like first thing in the morning, 7 a.m. while it's foggy, we'll pull. Um, and then as soon as the sun comes out, then we stop pulling um, and we'll usually devote you know, a couple of days, like it'll be, okay, beans, there's beans ready. We're going to pull all of the Hutterite beans and we'll pull those on Monday morning, you know, get 10 people over there and we'll pull a bunch of them and windrow them. Um, and then, yeah, it, it's not as, as simple as one acre blocks because sometimes different parts of the field dry down differently. So you just kind of got to be on it and watch it, but we sort of budget certain. So it'll be like, while the beans are during the time that we're harvesting beans, which will be a few weeks, usually end of August into September, beginning of September. So maybe it's like a month or so that we're pulling beans and we're probably devoting, say, six people two mornings a week uh, to pulling beans. And they're kind of targeting, okay, where's what's what's dry enough, leaving the stuff that's still too green. Um, and then once things are drying on the tarps, then uh, right now the the way we work it is there's over the course of I think this year it was probably two weeks or so of two people working every single day on it for some portion of the day, maybe not not the entire day, but there were two people like working a few hours every day um, and they would, they'd check the moisture and be like, okay, these are ready to thresh. And then we'd thresh those and then they'd move on to the next, or this is a little too wet. So they'd stop and come back the next day. I, I wish I had clear numbers, but um, it's pretty variable with the weather. Thank you, uh, Teresa, for uh, sharing all of that. Super helpful. Um, I'm going to switch gears a little bit um, and now ask Michael. Um, Michael, you mentioned earlier that as you got into the institutional market and um, they were asking you for more products, um, you saw the opportunity to help a variety of, or of producers and farmers to uh, help distribute their products more efficiently. So you have more of a... Um, more varieties of what you're um, providing to institutions. Can you walk us through what the dry bean supply chain looks like um, from your perspective and where next gen food fits in that picture? Sure. Yeah. Um, so the first grower we started working with is a guy named Ed Sills. He farms primarily in Sutter County. Uh, Pleasant Grove Farms, the name of his farm, and it's a pretty diversified operation that he has, um, all organic, a really uh, intricate rotation. Um, he, he's a he's a really uh, he's a great farmer and a real inspiration from a farming standpoint and uh, marketing and kind of vertical integration. So. He has all the equipment uh, to harvest his beans, and he has. Um, 
a full uh, sorting facility with optical sorters and de-stoners and the whole deal. He can pack in 25 pound bags or, or totes. So that was a pretty easy one uh, to work with uh, initially. Um, we do have other folks with other products um, that, you know, we're buying in totes. Uh, they're already clean and repacking them ourselves. We One thing I failed to mention is we actually own a co-packing facility as well in West Sacramento. It's a separate company, separate building. Uh, it's called Daylight Packing. And so we can repack uh, beans uh, and other dry goods here. And um, so we'll do that. Uh, we do quite a bit of that, actually, from 2,000-pound totes into 25-pound bags or two-pound bags or one-pound bags. Um, so Ed is, uh, Ed grows the organic black turtle beans, organic red kidney, organic mung beans for us. Um, I have a, a good friend from college, uh, Mark Kirsten. He's a, a pretty big bean handler in Lodi. Um, he's able to, he contracts with a lot of growers, uh, throughout the state. And so he's able to supply me with, uh, garbanzos, uh, baby limas, um, the organic garbanzos that we purchase as well. Um, he can, he can source a lot of black eyed peas. He can source a lot of different things. And some of them don't come from California, but you know, we still carry them. And then we work with some other brokers around the U S uh, primarily for pinto beans, um, which are a little bit harder to find some garbanzos from time to time when we can't get them out of California. Uh, and then there's a, another fairly well-known NorCal farm um, that uh, is actually uh, this week and, and last week are delivering beans to our packing facility to be repacked uh, into their own brand and one pound bag. So that's kind of how we interact with the, the bean uh, supply chain. Uh, obviously, it's much more complex than that. And, you know, we're continuing to kind of get into it. We've recently started working with some meal kit companies and some um, prepared food companies that, you know, deliver food to your home, some other facilities that, you know, are doing IQF, um, individual quick freeze after they're cooked. Um, so kind of supplying to folks like that, um, which is great. It really opens up you know, allows us to handle more volume and, you know, find cool new products and uh, make things a little bit more efficient from a supply chain and distribution standpoint. Um, so, yeah, I, you know, I think there's a lot of opportunity in the markets that we serve for, for dry beans. I certainly understand the challenges on the farm side uh, and the, you know, cleaning and harvesting. We actually, planted uh organic black beans on a on a field that we had uh and that was a, a very expensive lesson uh that i'm not a very good bean farmer uh, and my soil wasn't properly suited for it so won't be doing that again um but on on kind of getting back a little bit to Teresa's comment on storage uh i don't know if this is the right time to mention it but i i do have some six and eight ton silos, um, you know, cone bottom silos that that uh, I'm looking to sell. And then a couple of uh, Crippen cleaners that that could be of assistance to, you know, somebody um, here uh, to kind of get set up to handle beans if they are looking at doing something like that. So. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, follow up question related to this. Um, what scale a farmer does next gen food purchase from it sounds uh, can you clarify that like what is um or work with right like what is approximately like how many acres do they have um and, and do you work with smaller scale producers or are you willing to do you see yourself working with small scale producers if you're not doing so already yeah uh absolutely um in particular with our retail brand, True Origin Food. So kind of the, the point with this brand is to offer really unique, interesting uh, pantry staples. Um, on the back, we have a QR code that takes you to the website. And then 
uh, on the the code at the bottom by the Best Buy date has a, a specific code for a farmer for each farmer. Um, and so, yeah, absolutely. Organic garbanzo beans, these came from uh, Kim Gallagher uh, in the Grimes area. Um, so, you know, we have 20,000 pounds of these they're going to be in this bag until we're out and then hopefully we can find another supplier or if she's going to grow them again or who, whatever that is we can keep this product live at you know our retail stores and you know just have a different farmer id on there then on the website there's a lot of information about the farm so i would say for us it's probably like a ten thousand pound minimum that we would look for on a production just to be able to put into the retail thing um Perhaps there are opportunities for, you know, limited release products or um, smaller volume um, opportunities as well. We haven't really uh, developed those yet, but something we talked about. Um, I guess one of, one of the things I didn't really mention on the marketing side. Um, so we're selling these beans in our brand also online. So we have a Next Generation Foods has an e-commerce platform. Uh, via Shopify. Uh, we also sell, uh, on, you know, on Farm Fresh to You and uh, we're, these beans will be in uh, uh, all the Rayleigh's and, and uh, Bel Air stores here in a couple months. So kind of uh, trying to expand that side of things to not just in food service. Oh, great. Um, are you able to, do you know approximately how big Plus and Grow Farms is? specifically like how many acres of beans? I don't know how many acres have. of beans. They grow uh, popcorn, uh, wheat, rice, uh, vetch, and, you know, three or four different varieties of beans. And I think they grow a couple thousand acres. Uh, so pretty large, uh, but yeah, really interesting rotation and a lot of really cool uh, farming practices to build soil health and things like that. So, um, yeah, they're pretty good size, but uh, yeah, it's a it's a it's a nice operation. So, Michael, you're selling um, retail. You're selling direct to consumer. Um, you're also selling consumer sizes through wholesale accounts um, into grocery stores. So that's the one pound size, um, mm -hmm. and then you're selling the twenty five pound. Um, to institutions, sort of yeah. touching all those um, access points. Teresa, you're um, more direct to consumer. And I think I saw a flash across the screen, uh, screen when you were showing us some photos. You have a really beautiful, I don't know if it's like 12 or 16 pack of the different varieties of beans. And you were talking about how part of your ma marketing strategies um, is offering that diversity. Um, and so can you walk us through that? Like your approach to marketing and sales of the beans, um, what has worked, what you've learned? Um, yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I, so interesting. I'd love to, I, Michael, I am interested in one of those clipper cleaners. <laughs> by the way. So we'll have to talk later. Um, it's taken us years to kind of be able to move enough volume at the price point that we feel comfortable doing it in order to feel like the equipment could pay off. So a lot of the equipment, I think that, that it's just so interesting to, you know, there's just such a difference between if you're like a small scale producer versus trying to understand, okay, with the people that are really skilled farmers that grow beans, which obviously Pleasant Grove must be, he's doing a really great job at it. So understanding what that scale has to be to make all that kind of equipment financially viable, I think should be something that those who are listening into this and thinking about getting into beans should consider because there is a great efficiency in being able to, um, to sell, like Michael was saying earlier, dropping off thousands of pounds of beans to one location every week, like with these institutional buyers, right? Um, and it can be much simpler if you're not somebody who wants to go to a farmer's market every week and sell these tiny minute amounts and have, you know, there's a lot of disadvantages to what we do, one being that we have to store it all ourselves. 
um, if we're going to sell it directly to the consumer, we have to figure out how to store it. So we harvest it and then we have to clean it and we have to store it. Well, if you're on a bigger scale, you could be sending your product to somebody like Michael, who is going to help you clean it and is going to take it off your hands and keep it in the best possible optimal storage, you know? Um, that wasn't something that was available as an option to us because we are on a very small scale. We don't have that kind of acreage. We're not close in proximity to, um, there are like facilities that'll clean your grain crops for you. We're hours and hours away. And on the scale that we were growing them, it just didn't seem viable. Um, so we, um, one thing that I think it's important to consider if you're thinking about doing dry beans is to kind of work backwards uh, from what you think you need to make from them. Um, because beans are not, uh, in order for them to be lucrative, you have to be, you have to grow quite a bit. Like if you think about, um, if you're just a few acres, uh, try planting a few rows of beans and see how many you get. You might get like, <laughs> You know, you plant like three 200 foot rows and you might end up with, you know, a 50 pound sack, it, you know, or even less sometimes, depending on the variety. Think about how much you have to sell that for. Like, think about the effort and the amount of time and management. Um, you have to grow quite a bit to make much money. And beans are not the kind of dry beans that need to be cooked are not the kind of thing that uh, that sells that there's an interested there are people that are very interested in buying beans and there are people that are gonna buy them as staples. People that are buying them as staples and don't have a real interest in the unusual varieties, they're not gonna pay a, a high price point. And think about the volume that any one person will consume. People are gonna buy a lot more strawberries than they are dry beans. Like just think about your own usage if you cook beans or not. How many beans, how many pounds of beans can your family use in a year, right? There's just a limited, uh, a much more limited market than there is for something like uh, sugar, strawberries, raspberries, things like that, that people like will just gobble up and eat huge volumes of. Um, so I think it's important to think about how much you need to make and then try to make estimates of how much you'd need to produce and what the price point would need to be for you to make enough to make it worthwhile to devote part of your acreage to that. Um, but there are, um, there's also a lot of advantages. Uh, one thing that I, I keep thinking of other reasons why we're growing the beans, we have year round employees. Our employees, people aren't, people aren't seasonal, right? Um, farming is seasonal. It is like there are seasons where things grow better and seasons where they don't grow better. And we are fighting nature when we're trying to go year round, but people aren't seasonal. People, have health insurance year round. People's kids go to school year round and need new clothes year round and need new shoes year round. So we have set it as a priority that anybody we employ, we want to figure out how to make the job year round for them as well as for us and for the farm to support all of us year round. And this is one way that we do it is that we can, we can get all the beans under cover and this creates work when it's pouring rain outside. So during the month of January, when we just could not work, we had 15 people, you know, doing the final cleaning and sorting. Um, the We know that at some point we need to invest in, uh, at this point, I think we're at a, at a scale that we could invest in seed cleaners to do it. But we've also seen the resulting quality of beans that people who grow or people who are using the cleaners, the, the quality is different. Like when people look at a bag of our beans, I, I go and I check other people's product out. And our quality is just so much better because of this final hand cleaning that we do. Um, but I'm getting, I'm digressing. So I'm trying to, trying to get back on task, <laughs> get back on task here. Um, so in terms of marketing, we, uh, I think it's important to think about who you're marketing to. We did that. We thought, okay, we're primarily going to market to farmers markets. Who are the kinds of people that are going to farmers markets? What interests them? And so we've chosen these kind of very unusual, rare varieties. We didn't feel like we could sell for seven dollars a pound kidney beans, you know, that everybody you know is is sort of used to. Um, I'm going to show you a little bit of how we market. Uh, so let's see here. So currently. Um, oh, 
we've gone through a bunch of different iterations with packaging. Um, we now finally got felt like, you know, we ended up so we had this uh, stamp created and we would stamp these paper bags. There are other options. You could have stickers printed, put them in cellophane. Um, there's all sorts of packaging options. We went with this because we felt like uh, we wanted our product to look kind of boutique and, and, and rustic and, um, and reflect the fact that it is handmade. Um, and we now have managed to get them pre-printed, but the cost of pre-printing was we had to buy basically two or three years worth of bean bags to be able to do it. And we didn't have storage facilities. So these are just things to think about as you're thinking about, am I going to direct market my beans? And what am I going to do with them? And how am I going to package them? Because yes, this is a lot of labor to hand stamp each package. Um, but if you can't, if you don't have rat free storage to store, you know, 50 boxes or a pallet's worth of boxes, which is like the minimum you'll need to order to be able to have them pre-printed, then you're kind of stuck. So um, we've, uh, we do these gift packs. We finally, it took us a number of years, but we now market. So we, we send them to the farmer's market, um, but we also uh, sell, and we sell them to our CSA. We have a like bean share, an add on bean share for people that really love beans. Everybody has the option to add beans to their share each week. Um, but it's a way that we, again, create a CSA that can actually give people protein as well as the produce and the um, the vegetables and the fruit. Um, this is just a close up of different varieties. This is these are the pre printed ones that took us so long to get a hold of. Um, we have this. Uh, we had to raise our prices. We decided with the cost of labor going up, so much hand labor, we've had to raise our prices. But our feeling, our sort of philosophy, is our regular customers were willing. If we're willing to sell some of the beans cheaper to a restaurant, why not give the same advantage to our customers who buy in larger volume? So we have this uh, buy 10, get one free um, clicker card thing and each of the farmer's markets has little stamp, you know, people get these when they buy and if they get so many, then they get a free bag. Um, we tried larger volume bags, nah, it didn't really work well. The smaller volumes for us seem to sell better. We've experimented with a lot of stuff. Um, so I'm gonna, sh 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 let's see here, I need to exit this. Um, gotta figure out how to, oops, sorry guys. Didn't mean to show you videos of the, uh, there we go, I'm here. I'm going to take you to, oops, it's still going. Uh, how do I pause you? Um, we sell, uh, so through our CSA, this is the registration for our CSA. We have like the base produce share and then beans are an, an add-on that people can get every other week. And then they can also order extras every single week if they want them. Um, then we, and we also sell, this is our wholesale platform, um, that we have a bunch of restaurants and then some gross, small grocery stores that buy from us. And we offer both the boxed collections, individual pounds, and then we offer them in like one pound, three pound, five pound um, units for those for the restaurants, as well as cases of 12 for people that are going to resell. So we do have like uh, Good Eggs and the Buy Right grocery stores, a few little tiny, like high end boutique, uh, like fancy food stores that'll carry beans so they can buy those in 12 pound cases uh, that are prepackaged. Um, let's see. This is our, our website and we've, if you type in some of the unusual varieties, we definitely show up, we pop up and I get people contacting me all the time. It's taken a number of years, but um, we've tried to really work on figuring out what our story is and making sure that we can clearly communicate it to the customer and that there's access to information about these unusual varieties that we're growing. Um, so there's a we have descriptions on our website of each one of the varieties uh, that we grow. And then we try to make sure with our CSA, we have a bean each month uh, that's kind of highlighted and we'll do um, we'll send them recipes and, and help them figure out how to cook it and prepare it. See, what have I missed here? 
Um, I think too, uh, I mean, maybe that's a good moment to pause and, um, and bring Michael into the, um, the marketing and sales conversation and not to cut you off, Teresa, if there's something that you wanted to add, you know, no, I'm just checking my notes, yeah. but I think I've kind of gotten through all of them at the main points that I want to do. So. Yeah. Thank you so much, Teresa. Um, Michael, can you give us a little bit, uh, you talked a little bit about, you started talking about marketing in our previous little segment, but can you talk to us a little bit more about your approach to marketing and sales and what you've learned about selling dry beans to institutions over the years? Yeah, I'd, I'd say the biggest challenge we've run into is, you know, a lot of folks don't, they don't have the labor and they don't have the space in their facilities to rehydrate and cook dry beans properly. Uh, so there's a lot of resistance there from, you know, customers that I do a lot of business with, uh, with rice and other products. Um, so that's kind of been a challenge. I'd say it's getting a little bit better, uh, been having more and more, uh, volume going into our target customers. But, you know, if I was, I've been looking for a co-packer in, in, uh, California that can, you know, cook and either can or put beans into, uh, you know, a flexible bag for us. Um, and I think that would really open up a lot of doors for us. Um, just because it's that that's just the easiest way for a lot of these organizations to put out the volume that they need to, you know, support all their eaters. You know, you got a UC Davis in the dorms and there's six or 7,000, you know, people eating every day there. So anyway, it's, it can be a real challenge, um, but we're making progress. Um, yeah. I don't know what else to add here on the marketing side. A lot of my customers are interested in how things are grown, who's growing them, uh, what they're doing on their farm. So I try and do my best to communicate that. Uh, I think that there is opportunity for more of these, you know, specialty type varieties and heirloom varieties. I think that's really cool. Um, and even if it is, you know, a limited thing, uh, I know I have customers that would be interested in that. So you know, um, definitely don't want to discourage anybody from approaching us on, you know, more limited volume items. Um, I, you know, I, everybody that I work with is pretty excited about local food and, and uh, new stuff. You know, they, they want to work with, with uh, new products. It, you know, we serve a lot of these tech campuses in the Bay Area, and a lot of those chefs are you know, I've worked in really nice fine dining restaurants and, you know, have a passion for ingredients and food quality and things like that. And, you know, they're have transitioned into this more kind of cafe, corporate cafe kind of, or university food service role, primarily because they have a better uh, work life balance. And a lot of them have, you know, have families and things of that nature. But they're still very interested in and in working with really cool stuff and making really cool stuff. So uh, I think there's a huge opportunity there for these more niche varieties of beans. Awesome. So it sounds like the labor intensive aspect of um, having to rehydrate the beans for the institutional volume, which is like very, very large, is a barrier. Um, but at the same time, there is still like an interest so it's like, what what have you seen that like helps with that? You mentioned having um, like information about the beans and about the farm. So what do, what can you tell us about like the interest or willingness of of institutions, like those who are still um, purchasing your product, despite the fact that it is a labor intensive process for them? Yeah, you know, I, we do a lot of business with Bon Appetit uh, accounts and Sodexo accounts, and there's a strong incentive for those chefs to buy local products. Um, and so if they can't find them in a can, then a lot of times they're willing to do a little bit more work to, to incorporate those into the meals that they're making. Um, 
we do work with like UC Davis Med Center and Santana Diaz is the head chef there and he's awesome. He's like such a leader in the industry. Um, but it just comes down to labor and, and room and time. And uh, he does buy some beans from us. Um, but I know that he would be, he would have a lot of demand if we were able to get them cooked and in, in a can or in some kind of a flexible package for him. It's just a, a functional labor and space. So if anybody knows of a co-packer, uh, that'd be a great connection to have. I, I reached out to pretty much everybody I could find several years ago. Maybe the landscape has changed since then. So. Mm -hmm. Do you, um, what markup do you need to make what you, what you need to do? And this question comes from Teresa, actually. Yeah, I just wanted to kind of help people um, who are thinking about growing beans understand the difference between if they're doing volume um, versus if they're really small scale. Like we, the, the cheapest price we sell our beans for is $6 a pound in the five pound, we sell 30, $30 five pound bags to restaurants. Um, and then the, the single pound bags are between seven and $8. Um, I'm just curious, like when, when you're thinking about a niche crop, Michael, or like interest, you know, things that your chefs might be really interested in, what kind of a, like somebody like me wanting to sell to you, what kind of a price could I expect for you to be like, for you to be able to give them a price point that they'd, they'd be willing to, to pay but you need to be able to mark it up to cover your costs. So what, what's the kind of, what, what would somebody expect um, in terms of trying to figure out, okay, is, is institutional, is seeking that out worth my time? Yeah, you know, a, a decent amount of that uh, comes down to logistics. So in general, we pick up from our farmers or, or our suppliers. Uh, if, you know, if people are delivering to our facility, you know, we can sell a little bit, uh, uh, a little bit smaller margin than that. Uh, oftentimes, we're taking a position for our annual needs. And so uh, we might have a contract and we'll, you know, pay a lot of it up front and take inventory of product in our warehouse. Um, so, you know, you've got to look at carrying costs on cash, uh, plus, you know, tying up warehouse space. So there's a couple factors there. Um, you know, I would say as a rule of thumb, we're looking for 35 to 40%. Uh, and, you know, that includes us delivering it to the, the end uh, consumer, um, you know, and operating a business, right? So we provide healthcare for all of our employees and 401ks and, you know, living wages and things like that. So things cost money. Uh, businesses cost a lot of money to run, as you all know. And that's kind of a margin that um, has worked for us over the years. And, you know, just as a uh, kind of to give you a frame of reference on pricing, the most expensive of all the beans that I listed off, uh, we pay $1.60 a pound for. And those are organic mung beans. Uh, and that is we're picking those up at their facility. So um certainly admire uh you know folks that are getting much higher prices than that that's awesome and uh i know it's a really high quality great product and i'd love to try some i'll send you some yeah <laughs> thank you hi well um thank you michael thank you Teresa. this is a great time to switch over to a q a um, we will be having Q&A for about 12 minutes to respect everyone's time. Um, I want to acknowledge a lot that there are a lot of bean producers. Uh, one, one that I know of, Maria Catalan, that's on the call as well. Uh, she's a bean producer. Um, so this is an opportunity to share any questions. I think uh, first I'd want to ask Michael and uh, Teresa if you have any questions for each other. Um, I'd like to open it up for you two first. Um, and then go to the chat box. Um, I kind of asked a few, I already managed to sneak in some of my questions. So. Yeah, I think, you know, I'd love to connect offline and and uh, see how we can work together, so. Sounds good. Uh, 
then that's great. Um, then I will uh, ask a few of the questions that were in the chat box. Um, Rachel, was your question answered? Uh, I, be I believe Rachel says she had to leave the meeting, um, but she would like to have her answer also emailed. So we can we should definitely address it and then also follow up with her. Okay, sounds good. Um, so Rachel's question was, how can a small scale farmer obtain affordable harvesting and seeding equipment for dry beans? A lot of harvesting equipment is for larger scale operations. I need to leave. Yeah, she needed to leave the meeting. But um, does anyone have any any recommendations? Um, I can share a little information about our um, our standing thresher. But really, you can start on a very small scale without investing in some in the the kind of equipment that's super cost prohibitive. Is if you look and you analyze, if I'm only going to make ten thousand dollars off of my beans in a year. I can't afford to buy a three hundred thousand dollar <laughs> fancy um, harvester, twenty thousand dollar cleaner, whatever. Um, it's just going to take so long to ever pay itself off. Um, but you know, you can you can sow beans with a, a push seeder. You know, you shape beds however you're going to shape them. Sow them with a push seeder. You know, I mean, there you can do it um, as long as you have a tractor and you can tractor cultivate. I mean, you can do it by hand, but I think that. You, you, the profit margins just even at six or seven dollars a pound don't cover that kind of labor. But as long as you're sort of a tractor scale farm and you can cultivate, uh, you don't need a lot of the harvesting and threshing and cleaning equipment. Um, like I said, it's just a matter like it's very simple and the simpler. I just watched our neighbor Ryan also try things. And honestly, the the basics of just like some sort of an ATV or even a pickup. I mean, it's bad for the for um, for the transmission to go back and forth with an ATV. That's why or with a pickup. Um, but just driving back and forth over him on a on a uh, on a tarp and the, the technology, you can start very very simple. And if you know you can get that direct retail value, um, you can make it work. It, you know, it works out. It pencils out. And Teresa, we uh, sorry if you said this and I missed it, but someone was interested in the cost of the thresher. Oh gosh, um, I'd have to look it up. I mean, it was. Uh, I know that the cost of the shipping ended up going. It it left. It was supposed to be shipped in 2020, <laughs> right when the pandemic hit, and you know it, I think it sat in a shipping in a shipping container for like a year. It was kind of the cost of shipping went up as a result. I'm I'm trying to remember. Um, I'd have to look. It was it was over ten thousand, but it wasn't. It it surprisingly wasn't. I don't think it was more than like fifteen or sixteen. I think I'll have to I'll have to take a look. I'll I can uh, email that information to Gwinnell and and uh, you could share it with everybody. I'll I'll get a little more information about it. That sounds great. And we actually have, I think we have some nice video footage. It looked like you did too, Teresa, but we also captured some video footage of the thresher at Ryan's farm at Blue House Farm. So we could maybe package that along with some information about yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, I, I have some some hesitancy. I mean, it, it it saved us a lot of time, but you it it is not going to weather very well. <laughs> it's, you know, it's made in the third world. Um we're not going to easily be able to replace parts, you know, so there are things to consider. Um, I think we're happy with it. Um, but if you're just starting out, depending, if you're only going to do like five acres, you might want to wait a year or two and see how beans do on your farm before you invest um, in more equipment and just see what, you know, because the, there's also the constraints of your climate. It, um, if you get a lot of rain, you're going to have trouble with dry beans. So like the, the, I think there was somebody that was from the Pacific Northwest that had reached out to me and wanted to grow dry beans. And I was like, Ooh, that could be really tricky, really hard to harvest and get them dried and get them inside before the end of the, the season. Um, but I'll, I'll share, I'll share as much information as I, I can. Um, and I think that people that are on a larger scale, like I think knowing the kinds of volumes that um, Michael's business moves, 
like if I had, if we had more acreage at this point with the experience that we have, I think we could figure out, okay, like, oh yeah, we could definitely do these three varieties that are way more productive. And this would totally be, there's a huge overhead in direct marketing. So being able to not have to store it, I mean, that's a huge advantage, not having to store your own crop, being able to get it directly out of the field when it's harvested and off your site. Um, because there's a lot of loss that can happen if, it, you know, we had like a, a one of those macro bins, the wind blew the lid off in a storm and we lost 2000 pounds of beans, you know, um, all it takes is one little thing like that to, to have made it worthwhile to send your crop to somebody like Michael who has better facilities. So there's, yeah, I'm digressing, but. Teresa, do you insure your beans? No. Um, it hasn't been something that we've, I don't know, I guess we could look into it. We don't, we just sort of take like, yeah, haven't thought about it. I mean, there's, the beans are, are a pretty small portion of our business. We, we also, you know, it's a, it's a piece of the puzzle. That's a critical piece. It keeps people busy in the winter. It has this great advantage for crop rotation, but it is part of a mix um, that, you know, our, our produce, uh, our baby head lettuce and baby greens and strawberries are a much greater portion of our sales. So it's part of a, a yeah, a mixed um, marketing and production, yeah, plan. So. Yeah, and you mentioned, uh, if, I, if I heard you correctly, you mentioned that um, it, it's more of a, of a, a dry uh, climate sort of crop. So right now through the storms, have you had any issues? Um, have you had to make any adaptations? Uh, so beans won't go in until May or so. Uh, once that's when we'll sow and then we'll be harvesting in like August, end of August, September. And then, then we're just cleaning at this time of year. Um, we have, like awesome. I mentioned, like things, there are, things can happen um, like with, with storage, when you don't have great storage, you can end up losing a bunch of beans, but the, the season you, you, you sow once a year, uh, in the late spring, and then you harvest once a year. What we do is we get it out of the field and then we clean during the winter, clean and package and sell. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, we have one question from Susanna, uh, asking us. Um, sorry if I mispronounced that. Um, how many people harvest per acre? Um, and how long does it take to harvest and then to process one acre of beans? And what is the end year end yield uh, per acre on average? I wish I could give you clear answers. It's extremely variable. Um, so the we have kept pretty careful track on a few a few years of yields per variety. Uh, some varieties are will produce consistently double what other varieties do. Um, so there's like the, I can't give you. I mean, I on average five to six on, in a good year in a good year five to six tons an acre. Um, but that's that's a good year. Some years we have complete failures. Uh, last year, we had a bunch of issues with irrigation, timing of irrigation and weed flushes and we couldn't control the weeds and the weeds ended up, it was too costly to do any hand weeding. We, the tractor couldn't do it. Like we lost our window to do with the tractor and we ended up just tilling them in. Um, so it's, it's pretty variable one acre. I don't know, maybe, you know, three people might, might be able to manage all the, like all the, 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 um, harvesting and getting them out of the weather with, I don't know, 10 hours a week over the course of the period that we're harvesting. I, but it's, it is so variable. It depends on the conditions. It depends on your farm. It depends on how densely they came up. It depends on the weather. It, you know, I, it unfortunately goes way up and down every year. Um, though we have had like, of, you know, when, when the stands come out good, there is some consistency. Um, certainly certain varieties are always consistently heavier producers, but yeah, don't have good data. I just uh, dropped some 
resources in the chat too that folks can refer to, like some of them have, you know, discuss average yields and, and that sort of thing. So, um, and we can send those out as well after the, the webinar. Um, Michael, do you have anything to add in terms of just approximate yields that you see per acre? I I don't know. I'm not on that side. Really. <laughs> it wasn't enough when I grew them, I'll tell you that. There was. Um, it is very, very different depending on variety. Some varieties are, you know, and this is probably why certain varieties end up being dominant on the marketplace is that some are very heavy yielding and some of these more unusual varieties are really delicious or beautiful, but they're really low producing. So um, it depends on the quality of your soil. In poor soil, you get much lower yields. In nice soil, you get much higher yields, you know. Maxie, were you were you going to say something? Yeah, um, just want to point out the time and be respectful of of people's time. But there was a question that it was written in the chat, but not in the Q and A. Um, and I don't think it was addressed yet. It was about it was for Maria about the equipment itself. Was interested in the equipment and perhaps purchasing that. So, are you able, um, Teresa, to provide any? information about that um i can i can plan on emailing a list of the equipment that we use um i'll email to Gwinnell and we can pass it on wonderful um i believe okay. that there was another question from dominitla and i think it's it was her because of the samsung and i, I she's she was texting me telling me that she she was trying to enter the thing she said um, Dominita, if you're if you're on the if you can unmute yourself to ask the question itself, because I I am unclear as to the context of your question. We're in a webinar, so uh, our participants won't be able to unmute. Okay, thank you, Kate. Um, yeah, then um, I'll ask her. Uh, separately, and then I'll just email the question. I think that that's the best. Oh, I see a new message. Um. Yeah. Um, maybe just. To, yeah. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead, Gina. Um, I was just gonna say maybe a, I know we're getting right up on time, but maybe just a final um question on the production side. Um, someone's asking if formed beds are necessary. Um, so oh, was that if, if formed beds, like if shaping, I guess I'm guessing raised beds, if formed beds are necessary for small scale, or is that just to accommodate larger scale? Um, I guess it depends on if you're going to be, if you're planning on hand cultivating or hand weeding them versus tractor weeding them. So you can you can certainly, like I said, use a push seeder and just push a couple lines of beans on a bed. Um, but then you're going to be, the volumes are very low unless you're like your yield, you need to grow a lot of beans to get much volume. And for us, it, it certainly wouldn't make sense unless we were track doing it, like we, unless we were weeding with the tractor. So part of what makes it uh, work out and pencil out um, is that one person on a tractor is maintaining that whole six to 10 acres. Um, so if you aren't shaping, if, you, if you're not going to use some sort of cultivating equipment, for us, the easiest thing, what's worked the best is um, we have this 30 inch bed and we split the bed into two. We don't, we don't shape that bed. Um, we just, uh, we then run out, we, we've used, we've tried all sorts of different styles of tractor cultivation um but we tend to go through and we'll use shovels like we've tried I, we've tried all sorts of stuff i can like list out the various things that we've tried and my husband he said i tried to get him to kind of nail down what he's doing now and he said every year it's a little different what he tries um but we pass through like three plus times with the tractor so whatever your system is you're going to want to be able to tractor cultivate 
Um, so if you're if you're on a scale that you're hand seeding the beds um, and you're having to hand weed, I don't know that you can get a higher enough high enough dollar value from dried beans to make that really work out. Even at like ten dollars a pound, um, I don't know that it pen pencils out. All right, I want to um, thank you, Teresa and Michael, both for um, just sharing with us all your expertise and and um, with this group and your experience. Also, thank you to our interpreter and all of our attendees today um, for spending this hour and a half with us. And um, we hope this has been informative and helpful to you. Um, there were some resources that were shared in the chat. Um, so feel free to look at those. And I want to elevate that in the Q&A, um, Anthony, you asked something about conventional and organic dried beans. Um, and Michael answered that as a type answer. So just want to make sure that you saw that. Um, if you go to the Q&A, um, you can click on answered and see the type response there. Um, so just wanted to make sure you saw that. Um, and again, thank you so much. Um, and we hope you have a great rest of your, your evening and stay safe out there with all the rain. Um, and that's it for today.